Today's Left Brain lesson, we will be learning the how of programming by reviewing code examples that demonstrate debugging. We're going to talk about some basic, simple use cases, and then we're going to look at the stack trace. So when you have an error, a lot of information is printed out. The stack trace is the series of methods that led up to where the exception occurred. So we're going to look at what that means. Then we're going to talk about exceptions themselves. We're going to learn about the common types that come with Python. Then we're going to talk about exceptions. We're going to talk about some of the ways you can tell between a syntax tax error and an exception error and some of the common exceptions that we get in Python. Then we're going to talk about how to handle these exceptions. And some of the keywords we're going to learn, like try and accept, are very similar to the conditionals, if else, that we learned earlier. And then we'll talk about some other keywords, like finally and raise. And raise is a very important one because it's going to allow us to define our own exception. So we'll walk through how to do that. And then finally, we're just going to talk about common errors that beginners run into, some of the most common misspellings, the syntax problems, and just some basic stuff that you might be running into as you're just getting your feet wet with Python. So hope you're ready for all that and more. Let's get started. So to start our conversation today about debugging, I want to start with the first topic from our last lesson, and that was about how debugging is such a general thing. Now, certainly there are times when fixing a bug is obvious. An app crashes or the website breaks, the bug is breaking the website, and the programmer needs to fix it. But one of the frustrations a programmer will often have is that he or she is not on the same page as the team or the user. That line between features and bugs can get kind of blurry. So kind of to, kind of to poke fun at this, I wanted to show you what I mean. And sort of an extreme example here, if we have this function, and the goal is obviously to make Dylan handsome, what do you do about my bone structure? You know, you can't just get new bones. We are going to get an error. Could you imagine a boss getting mad at you because they thought it was going to do something that it can't do? That, a lot of times, is what debugging is about. So I want everyone to remember that as you're developing your skills and you're starting to go out there and actually get jobs, the first line of defense against debugging is not with the code. It's with having having really clear expectations with your team and with your bosses and with your customers and that you're listening to feedback and that you know what they're expecting. Because no matter how good of a coder you are, it is impossible when you can't reach into their head and build what they want because they haven't explained it to you clear enough. Just remember, debugging at its core is actually about communication. And then after that, debugging is about getting your expectations to work in the code. So here I have a function that is definitely going to return an error, the dreaded divide by zero. This is the error of all errors. It breaks everything from calculators to refrigerators. You never divide by zero. So we're going to do it to show you what kind of error we get. We're going to get an error, but what's it going to say? Did you expect something that helpful? Zero division error it says again down here, a zero division error with a colon and then division by zero. I mean, this is very helpful stuff. And look, it even goes here and shows first where the call was, the one closest to where we are, and then next where the return was. It's actually showing you the stack trace as it traces its way through the logic. And you can see down here, it even gave us this helpful number. By the way, if you want on a Jupyter Notebook to come to any cell and hit the letter L on your keyboard, you'll get the numbers. So here we can see that it actually looked at the numbers. Number three right here is correlating with number three right there. You see the zero division error in the camel case. This is all important stuff to note and really helpful because it helps us follow these things back to their origin. Because see, the thing about bugs is, is that they usually do happen moving down a page, but they really take place in logic that triggers logic that triggers logic. And sometimes the error occurs deeper down and it doesn't cause an error until later. So I want to show you a little bit more about this nesting problem. So talking about layering, I want to take this stack trace a little bit deeper. So here we have another function that I called layer of complexity. And in here, we're returning the call to another function, which is totally doable in Python because everything's an object. So in here, we're actually saying, my logic is run another function. And here we're saying this function returns bad code, a division by zero error. And try to imagine what it's going to do to the stack trace. OK, makes sense. Now we have three layers to our stack trace. We had two before, and we've added one more layer of complexity. Makes sense. So check this out. We still get our zero division error. We know what the core problem is. And over here, you'll see that this says traceback, most recent call last. So it's saying this one is the closest, and it's also going to be right here. And then this one is going to be right there. 
and then this one is going to be right there. So you can think of it as moving up and away from where we are right now. So pretty interesting way we can see the stack trace, and you can see how it gets you in the realm of where the bug is, or at least helps you deduce where the logic might be coming from. One of the differences between sort of the novice and the intermediate is how they use their terminology. Now to say that it broke or there's an error, it's true, but it's not as specific as we could be. We could also talk about error being done in syntax during the compile time, or we can talk about an exception, which is actually a specific way that you would word something, and it means something inside of Python. So let's dive into some examples. Now, if your code breaks, you get a syntax error, okay? That's a special type of exception. And you can see by this little arrow, what it's missing here is the colon. Totally easy, you could imagine missing it. And I notice that a lot of times where it puts this arrow isn't exact, like this happens to be a good one, it's telling you exactly where it is, but you can't trust this arrow to be perfect every time. Sometimes it will be the line right above this or something like that, but it does give you a hint on line two is where it thinks something went wrong, or at least the first thing it noticed. Like easy to fix, not a big deal. You know, a syntax error is more just to like, oh, I'm tired, I need some coffee, I need to pay attention to what I'm typing. Now, exceptions are a different story. They actually mean things and defined exceptions in Python when we first download it, and we can also add more, but they really are meant to give more specific cues to what's wrong with our logic. So let's look at some common exceptions. Some of the big ones are key error. Now you get a key error a lot when you're working with dictionaries. In fact, that's one of the reasons why we talked about using default dict, which is a separate module that mimics what dictionary does, but doesn't throw as many key errors. There's also an index error. This is raised when an index is not found. An IO error, this is gonna happen when we get into our section about files a lot more. A value error. And then runtime error is the one you can think of as the big general one. When it doesn't fit any of these other categories, you just get runtime error. It doesn't have any specific information to give you because it's not falling into one of these categories. But that's also a clue into the power of exceptions. You can think of them in sort of a hierarchy, like it's going to check like, oh man, something happened. Is this a key problem or an index problem? No, 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 fine, runtime error. But it's great when it tells you something specific because then you can kind of let your brain jump right into it. Now, I don't know all the exceptions by heart. These are some of the common ones that I picked out, but I put a list here. And maybe depending on the type of thing you're building or how you're coding, you might want to look through here and get familiar with the ones that are likely to come up in your situation. If you're working like on an old computer with not much memory or with a whole bunch of data, or but maybe you got a crazy keyboard error because you're a Dvorak guy and accidentally whatever this thing is hit the wrong keys or something so just realize that there are specific exceptions and if you get an error and you've never seen it before like you're like what is IO error go ahead and just cut and paste this into Google or follow this link and go find it on this page because then you can get some real specifics into what went wrong and it's a lot faster than trying to figure it out on your own every time so get familiar with common exceptions and know the difference between an exception and a syntax error. All right, you wanna talk about handling them? Sometimes those X's need to get handled. First way we do this is using a try and accept keywords. Now these are very similar to if then statements. So that's why we have them here in the conditional section. And the way that they're different is the accept is like its own special built-in if statement and it's going to look for a certain terminology an exception that exists and if it finds it it will print out the else statement or the else logic but it's a little more powerful than an if then statement because it has the ability to stop here we're going to try to open up a file and we don't have this file so we know it's going to give us an error because it's a file error we know that it's going to give us a file not found error and that's a special type of error a type that we get when we don't open up a file this is all built into python when we get to accept we can put in a keyword here saying if it's any exception or if it's a specific exception like a value error then do this so we can have a long list of these, just the same way we can have LIF statements, but these are looking for different exceptions, a hierarchy of them. And what we get is oops, because this is the most general type. Any kind of exception that we would have got in this block of logic, it happened to be a file not found error, but the divide by zero error or the value error, any of those would have caused it to jump into this logic and print. Okay, so in this next cell, we have a more specific error. Now we know that this is causing the file not found error, but we're only saying print this logic if it's a value error, which we know it's not. In this, we're actually not gonna get our exception. We are gonna actually get back our 
file not found error, the exact thing that we were expecting up here. And it's going to point to the line where it happened, and it's going to launch into our stack trace. You're starting to get a sense for this hierarchy thing. Now, you want to throw these in your code to make sure that you know a user is inputting the type of thing they're supposed to, or you don't cause some kind of memory leak with some kind of loop that doesn't end. You have to have some exceptions. But also, Python does have a philosophy, which is just do it first, and if it breaks, then go back and add some of these exceptions. So also, don't, don't be a worry wart. You know? Don't put these everywhere. But when you do have problems and you start realizing that there's a place where your code's vulnerable to a lot of variation and you know it can't handle all the variation it might get, that is where you start putting some of these things in. So I just want to get a little bit more specific. Now look what happens when we target the specific exception that it throws. The file not found error is what it gives. And last time we used a value error instead so that we actually got the stack trace. But in this case, we are going to get the oops logic because the the type of exception that came was that. Look what happens here. Imagine I get rid of it altogether. It will still be the same as putting in that general up here exception. So that's kind of like the default. If you don't see anything there, assume that it's going to go for any exception. If it's not matching, it's not going to print if you specify what it is. And finally, I just want to show you how you can get a whole range of these. So you might say, all right, you got this uh, file not found error. If you get that, print this logic. But if that one's not there, try this logic. So we get our first error. And if it's exactly there, ex we expect, do this. If it's still an error, but not the error that we expect, give a more general turn. We know that the error is a file not found error. So we get this first layer. But had it been something else, it would have fallen down here to the exception. And if we didn't have this at all, and it didn't match that, then it wouldn't have gone anywhere. And we would have just had a big problem with our code. And we would have had a bug. We don't like bugs, and now we know that we have this powerful try and accept tool. To build on that, it's one of those things that we don't use a ton, but there is one more thing we can use, which is a finally keyword. And the finally keyword is something that will just jump over something else. So we have try. We know we're going to get a file not found error. It's going to launch into this logic. And then it's also going to skip over all this stuff and do one thing at the end. And the reason we might need this on kind of a rare occasion is if you need to get out of something like you have to open a file and close it no matter what. Even if there is an error somewhere in the middle, it needs to know to go to the bottom of the page and do one last final thing to sort of tidy up your code. So for example, if we run this, what we do is we get, as we expected, the logic block that matches the exception. And we also get this finally statement ran, which might be something like you know closing out the page or something like that in a weird situation. And it's going to jump over the else stuff here. OK, so now you know. Try accept and finally. So very powerful keyword, just like globals or return. This is one of the special keywords that's reserved by Python. And you can actually just run it by itself. And you will get a runtime error. Now, raise signals to Python that we are raising an error no matter what. Depending on what we do, say like, hi, now we have a type error. If we have nothing, it's going to have the most general type of error, a runtime error. But this is saying, hey, something's wrong, and we need to throw an error. And you can put these in your code, like between um, try and accept statements, or even between if else statements, if you need to raise errors. They're also more powerful than that. We can actually raise and then specific functions that have been created for each type of error that's already inside of Python. And each of those errors, because it has a function, accepts an argument. And that argument is where we can put in specifics about why we have a name error thrown at this point. So here we're going to raise a name error and we're going to specify some extra information. So you remember before, like with the divided by zero error, after the colon, there was some special information that said you had divided by zero or something. So here we can actually say, through a name error, which is a common error, it happens for specific reasons, but here's some more information. This error happened because it was hammer time and there wasn't time. Hammer took all of the time, so there was a problem. Okay, or whatever. 
Now, if we want to make a custom exception, we need to build a class. You may or may not have seen this, depending on the order that you're taking the course in, but if you haven't seen a class, don't worry about it. It's just like a fancy function, but just look at the syntax and you'll see that that's how it works, but don't worry about the details. You don't need to know what a class is at this point. So we're just going to make a class, but it's called custom exception, and it's bringing in an argument, just like a function. And if we do raise custom exception, and it's been defined above, we can have our own exception. Now, this is the least amount of logic you can have in a class or a function, but we can put in more. But for basics, we just want to signal to somebody that an error has occurred. So we can simply raise custom exception, which has been defined right above. And we can say, you know, do you need any lipstick for your sushi or lipsticks? Oh, do you have any lipsticks for your sushi? By the way, lipsticks was an invention I had. Uh, we get it uh, another time. So. Here we have our custom exception, any lipsticks for your sushi. And it shows where it was raised, and it was raised by our custom exception. Okay, and finally, I want to show you that you can bundle together these exceptions. So before, if you remember up here, we were actually doing it in sort of a hierarchical way. We were saying, you know, first look for this one, and then look for this one, and we were just lining these up one after another. But there is another way to do this. We can bundle them together like we are right here. And we can say, try this. And if you get a specific type of exception raised, check it to see if it's this one or this one or this one. And if it's any of these that are in this tuple, then print this logic out. So let me just show you right here that we are going to raise an exception and it's a custom exception, the one that we had up here. And that one is in the list. So we do expect it to print this logic. Boom, just what we expected. Now, if we don't actually raise that, nothing's going to happen. Or if we raise a value error, it's actually going to give us the stack trace because it's going to break right here instead of going down to the accept section. Just a thing to note that you can you know, define these custom exceptions and then you can actually group them together in lists and use them later. And that might be important if you're, you know, trying to talk to another developer and say, hey, here's the specific type of error. It's not like anything that Python does normally by default or you're trying to show a user something. So it's important to know about rays and then of course, exception handling. And let's finish off by just talking about some common errors. So I found this great blog and you can see the link in the resources section, 16 common runtime errors that beginners run into. And I thought that was pretty useful. So I defined a function right here. So we defined this variable span. Now one of the first common errors you'll have with a with or an if or a function is that you'll just forget to put that colon at the end and it happens all the time. And when that happens, you'll see the little arrow usually does point to the right place. You get a syntax error, invalid syntax. When you see that, think colon. Here we're using a single equal instead of a double. So if you remember from our comparison operator, we actually need two if we're saying, is this that? And a single is an assignment, which means we're going to assign the variable to the number 42. And when that happens, we get a syntax error and it's pointing to the place where we think it is. It doesn't know why you're trying to assign something if you put if there and you put a colon afterwards. So that requires the double equal. The next thing is having the wrong amount of indentation. Now this one's pretty common. Now I once read that you're supposed to hit spacebar four times. But I always just use single tab, which I think is okay also. And I've also noticed that if you use two spaces or even three spaces, but you're consistent with it, usually it will run, but I don't think that's a very good idea. So sometimes when you're cutting and pasting things into Jupyter Notebooks, you'll notice the spacing is different, but it'll work if it's consistent. I'm gonna say tab, just always one tab in. But in this case, we're gonna get an indentation error because print doesn't go indented. It needs to be pulled all the way back if we want both of those things to print. And also up here, look what happens if we do say two spaces. Seems like it works fine. If we go one space, seems like it works fine. But you can see when it gets two indentations and they're not at the same spacing, that's where the indentation error is going to be thrown. Okay, another problem, missing one quote. It happens all the time. Here you can see that hello only got its closing quote. It's missing its first one, so it's not a string. So it's going to throw a syntax error. You're going to see the arrow at the first place where it sees the error, but we know that we actually need to add a comma in over here. Hello. This is probably the most common error I ever remember getting is that you just misspell something. Define a variable or a function up here and then later you're just looking for it and you get it wrong and you're going to get a 
name error, the most common error you'll ever find. And you just need to go check that and say, oh, okay, line three, foobar, oh, foobar, okay. I need to spell it right. My name is Al, or AI, actually, I'm going to say. Okay, and this error is when a method is misspelled. It's a little bit different than when you're missing a variable, which would have given us the previous name error. But here you'll get an attribute error because it's going to see that dot syntax. So you'll have to make sure that that is spelled right if you see the attribute. And then also remember, if you put this right into an assignment, you're not going to see the result, but it's not necessarily an error. Just something to remember that you have like a verb here. You're actually doing an action to this variable, and then you're also assigning it into a new variable with the same name. So just make sure you know what's going on there. And here, the final one is just using one of the keywords that's already been reserved by Python. If you're not looking and you don't notice that this is in bold right here, you can't use class for a variable name. If you do, you are going to get a syntax error. You know, Jupyter, these are pretty easy to spot just because they're always in bold right there. And you could always just, you know, add one more S. Now it's going to work just fine because now it's a unique word that can be used as a variable. All right. So we've worked through some of those common errors. We've looked at debugging and stack traces and exception handling. We are freaking great debuggers. Good job, everyone. I will see you in the next lesson. Subscribe to our Mnemonic Academy YouTube channel for daily uploads that will help you learn amazing concepts through effortless associations.